Hey videographers and live streamers. This is the Blackmagic 6K Cinema Camera. First impressions, it's big, particularly the 13 centimeter diagonal screen on the back. But let me put it on the tripod and switch over so that you can have a look at the image it creates. Viewers like you have asked me to review this camera or its 4K partner, and it's taken me some time to convince Blackmagic's media agency that I was worthy. Hopefully better late than never. This is a very interesting camera. In this video, I'll show you the camera configured as a studio camera with the Blackmagic ATEM Mini. There's a second video, a more complete review for standalone or field production. Uh, the 6K cinema camera has a 23 by 13 millimeter sensor that's called Super 35, which is a fairly loosely defined term. Resolution is 6144 by 3456. Now it is a body only camera. It uses the Canon EF lens mount, which provides a great deal of flexibility for lenses. <laughs> I'm using a 35 millimeter prime. EF lenses on this sensor crop to about 1.5. The menu and the screen makes it clear that this is a video camera at a very advanced level. Uh, using it in studio simplifies the complexity needed for standalone shooting. It's also kind of overkill using a 6K camera for HD. And while it's certainly suitable for studio use, that hardly starts to capture the range of its abilities. Now, I've connected the Blackmagic camera to the ATEM Mini using the full-sized HDMI port on the camera. It established a two-way connection between the camera, the Mini, and via USB, the MacBook I'm using to control the Mini. The camera's maximum resolution output to HDMI is 108060. When HDMI is connected, only Blackmagic RAW is available. 6K provides the full sensor output. I'm using the video dynamic range setting that conforms to Rec. 709 for HD video. And when the camera is live, a red on-air warning appears on the camera's LCD screen, and the front tally light is red. When I switch to another input, it's off. It turns green when the camera is in preview on the desktop control panel. On the desktop, the camera control tab also shows it's live. Uh, this panel only works when a Blackmagic camera is connected. Uh, these settings may not make sense unless you're a studio camera control engineer. <laughs> I'll give you a quick overview. The lift tab controls iris. Slide the red dot up and down to open and close. The bar on the left shows you how much, but not with an f-stop number. Adjusting the left and right controls the pedestal, also called the black level. Now, I'm demonstrating this as if I'm doing it by eye, but in the studio setup, I'm using the waveform on an Atomus Ninja connected to the output of the Mini to actually judge the exposure. On the camera, it's ISO. But on the control panel, the setting is gain. Zero dB corresponds to an ISO of 400, one of the camera's native ISOs. Increasing the gain to 6 dB displays on camera as ISO 800. Uh, 2 dB seems about right. Uh, I've set the white balance to correspond to the Kelvin value for the lighting that I'm using. Uh, it can be adjusted from 2500 to 10,000 K in 50 step increments, more control than usual. The button on the left activates color bars for standby mode and sets the detail off, default, medium, and high. <laughs> I prefer off. On the right, a button resets any or all of the settings. Uh, settings can also be copied from one camera to another, useful in multi-camera situations. And there are two more tabs, Gamma and Gain, and you can expand any camera to see all three, revealing sliders for contrast, saturation, tint, and RGB. Uh, this really emulates the interface of a professional color grading system, and if you've been using DaVinci Resolve, these will look familiar. I'm not going to pretend I know what I'm doing here. Now, typically, the engineer would use a chart, like this DSC chroma chart, to set up the camera under the lighting conditions using a waveform 
and a vector scope. Now, it would be nice if the camera or the Mini's control panel supported some exposure metering display. Waveform and vector scope are really essential when you're making these adjustments. I'll note that Blackmagic does sell an optional hardware device uh, with those capabilities. The camera's LCD does have a histogram and supports Zebra. Press the button on top left to switch from one to the other. Zebra can be set with five-step increments from 75 to 100. If you're using Zebra to set skin tone, uh, that's kind of a higher range than is useful. False color provides an alternate exposure visualization. For dark settings, black areas are good, blue and purple are crushed, yellow and red indicate overexposure and clipping. Uh, pink, at one step over middle gray, might be a good way to judge skin tones. I said the camera had a native ISO of 400. That's used at ISO settings from 100 to 1000. From 1250 to 25600, the native ISO is 3200. As the manual says, if you can avoid using 1000 and go to 1250 instead, you'll have cleaner results. Back to the desktop controller. The dial across the bottom adjusts focus, as long as you're using an autofocus lens. The bottom right side button sets focus automatically. Now, there is no continuous autofocus option, and while that's not required in this locked off setting, if your studio has a camera operator, focus can be judged with an expanded view punch-in, although the big screen already provides good assistance. Double tap the screen to access the expanded view, pinch to zoom further. Double tap to return to standard view, or select peaking from the overlay. Select low, medium, or high, depending on your subject. Kitting this camera up with a cage and rail system and a follow focus control would really provide a solid studio configuration. Uh, there are on-screen guides and grids to assist with framing. One thing, it would be nice if the LCD swiveled up and down for higher angles and shorter operators. For lenses with a motorized zoom, there's a zoom control. And the Mini can manage up to four Blackmagic cameras. This panel really opens up the potential of the cinema camera. There's an audio tab for control of sound. Uh, in addition to its onboard mics, the Mini has both 3.5mm and Mini XLR inputs. An adapter, available as an optional accessory from Blackmagic, is needed to connect standard XLR cables. I'm using a shotgun mic with an XLR connector. It requires phantom power. The camera's audio control screen can select sources for left and right channels independently, so I can record the mic on one channel and the camera ambience on the other. The screen can select the internal mics, XLR at either line or mic level, as well as 3.5mm at line and mic. For phantom power, the second panel turns it on. Now, unfortunately, those controls are not available on the Mini, and while it would be nice to have, it is a one-time setup in a studio situation. Volume can be set, and rather than pull the fader up all the way, I'm adjusting the input gain. I won't discuss operation of these, but there are both equalizer and limiter compressor control panels to further manage audio from the camera. This really is pro-class stuff. The Mini's audio controls mean that audio from one camera is easily combined with video from another source. In addition to recording the HDMI output from the Mini, there are internal SD and CFAS slots, or an external USB-C SSD drive can record the camera's signal directly. Make sure the cards and drives you use are on Blackmagic's supported media listing. The menu is attractive, well-designed, and very responsive to touch. It feels logical and well-organized, 
I didn't have any issues finding items. Uh, that said, the on-screen overlays are small and easily lost in content. I'd appreciate an option to increase the size. With the power adapter, the camera is AC powered, so no concerns about battery life. This video, recorded in September 2020, used software version 6.9.6. And although 6K does seem overkill for HD studio use, it really is an ideal studio camera, particularly when paired with the Atom Mini. I'm also preparing a full review of the cinema camera for field operation. I'll post that soon. And if you post relevant questions or civil comments, I will read and reply. YouTube provides the ability to subscribe to my channel without cost or obligation, but that's a decision that I leave to you. Of course, you may already be a subscriber, in which case, thanks. Stay safe.